Hi, I'm Val Smith. I'm City's Chief Sustainability Officer. I'm really pleased to be joining you today to share some insights around how City is helping to drive both sustainable finance and climate aligned finance. I'm going to speak to two of City's particular ESG priorities during my time with you. I'm going to talk about our um, $1 trillion sustainable finance goal, as well as our more recent net zero by 2050 commitment. But I first wanted to talk a little bit about City's sustainability journey. Um, I think in order to understand where we are headed and some of our current priorities, it's really important to also understand where we've been. And while I think we can all agree that sustainability and ESG more broadly is um, a rapidly evolving and accelerating topic, and it's one that is newly on the agenda for many of us, many, many companies, many, many of our clients, investors. It is not a new area for City. We have been investing in and um, in understanding the intersection of sustainability and finance for more than two decades now. Some of the highlights as you look across this rather um, busy timeline at this point include our participation in the creation of some of the key industry frameworks, such as the co-creation of the Equator Principles in 2003, the co-development of the Green Bond Principles in 2014, and most recently, we were a founding signatory of the Net Zero Banking Alliance Guidelines um, just last year in 2021. We also have been uh, very focused on target setting throughout our journey with our um, initial operational goals for energy, for water use announced in 2007. Um, you know, more recently doing some goal setting in the net zero space, which I'll speak about in the sustainable finance space as well. And I think underlying this entire timeline is a focus from the very beginnings on disclosure, transparency, and stakeholder engagement. So really looking forward to sharing some more information about our journey and our lessons learned with you throughout this timeline. So I'd like to now start with a description of one of our key ESG priorities, our $1 trillion sustainable finance goal. This is a $1 trillion commitment to sustainable finance that City announced in April 2021, so just, just coming up on a year ago now. And it's a commitment that we break down in terms of environmental finance and social finance. Although increasingly we are seeing that these silos of environmental and social are interconnected and that a lot of transactions meet both environmental and social criteria. But to sort of break this down, we have committed $500 billion to environmental finance and $500 billion to social finance all by 2030, adding up to $1 trillion in sustainable finance by 2030. A big piece of work underneath this commitment is the development that we've been um, undertaking for well over a year now of our environmental and social finance taxonomy, our definition, if you will, of environmental finance and social finance. Our taxonomy is aligned with the SDGs, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and um, on the environmental side includes renewable energy, clean technology, sustainable transportation, water conservation and quality, green buildings, energy efficiency, circular economy, and sustainable agriculture and land use. And on the social finance side, it includes affordable housing, affordable basic infrastructure, economic inclusion, diversity and equity, education, healthcare, and food security. Um, we have a number of different banking products, financial services products that can count toward this target. And those include lending, capital markets activity and the debt and equity underwriting um, markets, um, M&A advisories and mergers and acquisitions, advisory and finance. As we see the sustainable finance world really expand, sustainable financial products really expanding, we are seeing a proliferation of different types of financial products that we consider for inclusion under this, this commitment as well. I just like to drill in a little bit more to the criteria that we've established for our sustainable finance goal. We have a well, more, well over 40 page 
um, set of guidelines now that we provide to our bankers internally to explain our criteria, um, our taxonomy, if you will, of environmental and social, and to really provide detailed definitions around cities' definitions of, um, of sustainable finance so that our bankers can understand and also relate to our clients um, what we consider to be sustainable finance. This is a living document. The Obviously, the space of sustainable finance is really um, growing quite, quite rapidly, and we've found that it is helpful to have um, a fairly well-established taxonomy that is um, understood across the bank so that as we're engaging with our clients on these activities, we're able to identify early on what um, types of transactions might be able to be counted toward our goal. We will be reporting in our annual ESG report. Um, our progress toward this goal, we'll be doing our first complete year of, um, of disclosure against the goal in the report to be published in April of this year. So really excited to be sharing with you more information about this goal and how City is tracking against our commitments. So I now would like to share with you some information about our second ESG, one of, one of two of many actually, but what our second ESG priority that I'm going to discuss with you today, and that's our net zero commitment. Um, this is a commitment that we announced on March 1st of 2021, just over a year ago now, on our CEO Jane Frazier's first day as CEO. And our commitment included a commitment to net zero by 2050 for emissions associated with our financing, so our financing of our corporate clients, for example. And it also included net zero operations for our own facilities by 2030. We said that we would start our net zero by 2050 commitment by establishing um, 2030 targets for our energy and loan portfolios and uh, that we would commit to annual disclosure of our, our metrics and our progress. We also discussed how we were going to be part of or are considering some pretty important industry collaboratives that have formed. Um, the Partnership for Carbon Accounting Financials, which is a particular methodology that Citi joined in 2020, which helps banks understand how to attribute a client's emissions to the bank based on their loans outstanding or loans committed to a client. Um, that is one methodology that has been really central to our net zero commitment and our net zero methodology that I'll talk more about. The other industry guideline is one that we helped to create and launch in April 2021. So just, just almost a year ago now, which is the Net Zero Banking Alliance. The Net Zero Banking Alliance includes a wide variety of banks from across different regions that have come together um, to collectively define and commit to net zero. Um, we've found that the Net Zero Banking Alliance provides a very useful set of guidelines in terms of what a good net zero plan should mean from a bank. And it's also quite helpful because the Net Zero Banking Alliance is part of the broader Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, which includes asset managers, asset owners, the banks, insurance companies, and others, so that you can see the entire financial system really having a joined up and coherent approach to Net Zero as we engage with our clients, as we engage with our companies um, on their transition to Net Zero plans. So the Net Zero Banking Alliance guidelines um, require or request that banks set um, 2030 or sooner emissions reduction targets on their path to net zero by 2050, that they um, analyze a certain set of sectors, industry sectors, for um, consideration in their net zero target setting process. You can see the list of sectors here on this slide. They ask that banks um, review their targets and their commitments on um, an every five-year basis. And again, going back to the disclosure point that they annually disclose on their metrics and their progress and their lessons learned. So building on these commitments and these announcements, City spent the past year 
um, developing our net zero methodology, our net zero metrics, and it all aligns with and falls under our net zero financing frameworks, framework, which you can see here on this slide. Um, the net zero financing framework includes a series of different elements. The first is that we calculate the emissions associated with, in this case, we're looking at our loan portfolios um, and specifically our loan portfolios to the energy and power sector. So you calculate your, your emissions and establish a baseline. Then you identify the appropriate climate scenario, the, the transition pathway, if you will, for that particular sector. Once you have the baseline emissions for today, you identify the climate scenario to 2050, net zero by 2050 pathway. And then you can use that for target setting purposes in our instance for setting interim emissions reduction targets for 2030. Once this work is developed and you have your metrics, your climate scenario, your target setting results, then the big lift be happens, uh, begins with an implementation strategy. Throughout all of this, um, we are prioritizing engagement, both internally um, as we pull together all of the different relative elements of our bank, um, from bankers from, for different industries, our risk managers, legal, et cetera, but even more importantly, external engagements. There is a tremendous amount that we have to learn from our clients in terms of their transition plans, from our investors in terms of what they expect from a bank like City and how they are approaching decarbonization for their own portfolios and from NGOs. Um, I think increasingly the NGO community is helping to provide a really important level of expertise um, and also diving in also into the specifics around how specific sectors can and need to decarbonize. So this is the net zero framework that we've set out. Um, and we, I wanted to mention, we've also published this information around our net zero framework and the specific metrics in our 2021 TCFD report, our 2021 Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures report, which, which we published in January, on January 19th, 2022, just about a month and a half ago now. So let's talk about the results, the, the initial results of our net zero work and specifically our 2030 targets for the energy and power sector. This follows the net zero framework that we saw on the previous slide. Um, essentially through the use of um, both reported data from our clients as well as estimated data through the use of the Partnership for Carbon Accounting Financials methodology for attributing a client's emissions data to a bank, we were able to determine our 2020 baseline for our finance emissions um, or emissions intensity in the case of power. For um, the energy sector, our 2020 baseline finance emissions is 143.8 million metric tons CO2e. And for the power sector, our 2020 baseline is 313.5 kilograms CO2e per megawatt hour of electricity generated. Um, we expect that um, as climate data improves over time, as um, our clients, more and more clients disclose their greenhouse gas emissions directly, that these baseline numbers will improve, our data will improve, um, and our ability to make decisions also will improve. Um, but we wanted to put this information out there to, to help the market understand how we are approaching our net zero commitment and where we're starting from. We also identified um, in our TCFD report the climate scenarios that we have selected for our net zero target setting process for each sector. For the energy sector, we have used the IEA net zero emissions 2050 climate scenario, which is a 1.5 degree or net zero aligned scenario. For the power sector, we selected the IEA Sustainable Development Scenario OECD pathway. Most of our power portfolio is um, based in OECD countries. And so we opted to use the um, quite aggressive OECD pathway for our entire um, portfolio for the purposes of target setting. 
this exercise with the baseline emissions with the climate scenario resulted in 2030 targets for the energy sector of 29% reduction, absolute reduction from 2020 baseline. Um, for the power sector, we selected a 63% emissions intensity reduction in scope one intensity per megawatt hour generated or 115 kilograms of CO2e per megawatt hour generated. And I wanted to just spend a moment on um, why we decided to set slightly different types of targets for each sector. For the energy sector, we opted for an absolute emissions reduction target because we know that in the near term, in order for um, us globally, society to accomplish um, our net zero goals, that we need to reduce em emissions associated with the energy sector by on an absolute basis in the near term. On the power sector, on the other hand, we know that in order to accomplish our net zero objectives, we really need to ramp up electrification. We need to electrify everything, our transportation, our heating, while at the same time decarbonizing that electricity and, and emissions intensity um, target allows us to sort of decouple the electrification of um, our economy from the carbon associated with that economy. So I'd like to just close on a discussion of how we are beginning to um, get to the, the important part of our net zero framework around operationalizing our net zero targets. Now that we have established and published these initial net zero targets for the energy and power sector, we'll be working on other sectors over the course of this year. We wanted to share with our clients, with our investors, with our stakeholders, how we're beginning to think about the assessment of our clients in these sectors. So we published this checklist, if you will, that um, shares some early thoughts that we have in terms of how we will analyze and engage with our clients. We intend to, and we, we communicated this in our disclosure, we intend to spend the next two years really going through a process of client assessment and engagement to understand where they are on their transition journey and how we can help them. Job number one is that many of our clients do not currently disclose their greenhouse gas emissions. And so the, very, the priority, the very first thing to do is to encourage them to publicly disclose their greenhouse gas emissions. Um, scopes one and two, scope three, also important um, for the energy sector as well. And we, with that information, will not just work to understand their greenhouse gas emissions profile, but also want to begin to understand their transition profile. What are their near-term decarbonization targets? What are their longer-term decarbonization targets? We expect that many of our clients will have begun on this journey, but won't, won't yet have a fully-fledged strategy to, um, to accomplish net zero by 2050. And so we want to really lean in and help our clients through advisory, through transition finance, to, um, to realize this transition. We believe that many of our clients will be able to transition. Um, we have reorganized many parts of our business to really dig deep and help our clients to transition and engage with them in this shared journey. So thank you very much for your time. Um, very sorry I can't be with you in person, hopefully in the future, but um, really appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit about what we are doing in the sustainability space and specific to sustainable finance and climate finance. Thank you.